Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 858, 858, Monday, August the 5th, 2019. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, uh, before I get to the news of the day, not too much to talk about today on the Spygate front, but there's a couple things uh, that are worth noting. But uh, before I get to that, uh, I did have a few comments in the comment section um, about this uh, shooting. So I guess a lot of you know that I live... Uh, close to Dayton, Ohio. I live about 30 minutes south of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Um, so uh, a lot of people, not a lot of people, but several people made comments from the last video about the shooting up in Dayton. So yeah, that's about 30 minutes north of me. Um, and to be honest with you, I didn't know anything about it. Uh, I was up late Saturday night. I don't think I went to bed Saturday night till like 2 o'clock in the morning or something. Um, and I didn't hear anything about it, to be honest with you. Um, I got up on Sunday morning and I guess maybe around 11 o'clock I got on the computer and I was uh, just going through the um, my news feed and that's when I saw the story and I was kind of reading about it then but I, I didn't know anything about it till Sunday morning. Uh, I actually had some friends that were uh, in from out of town from Arizona and they they were actually up at Wright Pat uh, Air Force Museum. I think they went on Saturday afternoon. so. I guess I'll find out. Hopefully, they're, everybody's okay. But um, yeah, I didn't really know anything about it until I read about it. So I live like 30 minutes south of there. So obviously, um, not real close, but close enough, I guess. <clears throat> um, I guess the interesting thing about this uh, shooter here, this one in Dayton, Ohio, it looks like he shot his sister and his and her boyfriend first, and then he went and shot these other people. Uh, this dude was. Um, from Bellbrook, they actually gave his address, and I'm familiar with exactly where he lives. I know the street he lives on. Uh, this is not, this kid doesn't come from the ghetto. He doesn't come from a low income type, uh, you know, inner city neighborhood. I mean, he comes from a, kind of the suburbs, kind of a middle to upper middle class area. That's kind of a, you know, a little pricey area. I mean, real estate values there are double two, two three times what they are where I live. Uh, he, he lives in a much nicer suburb than I live in. Um, so, you know, this kid obviously didn't come from like the inner city, he wasn't a poor kid or anything like that. He comes from a pretty good upbringing. Apparently he was a student in psychology. Uh, his sister was going to some sort of um, uh, medical school or something. So, you know, this, this you know, it's, it's uh, you would think and when you look in these types of areas, you know, you see these real nice houses and, you know, the nice manicured lawns and these real nice communities and you just, kind of look at it and think well there's probably you know it's the nuclear family lives there mom and dad two or three kids and and all, everything looks nice and good there uh, and and you think about kids who are real troubled and have issues and get into all sorts of things like this kid was uh, maybe into satanic stuff uh, you know things like that and you think well these are kids who come from bad areas they don't they, you know they don't have two parents in the home they come from the inner city uh, they they grow up in a real bad situation, and so they have a real sort of negative, dark outlook on life, and it draws them into this darker world where they engage all sorts of uh, these types of thoughts. But, you know, when you look at not just the shooter from Dayton that I'm referring to, and he was actually from Bellbrook. Uh, Bellbrook is a suburb uh, sort of southwest of Dayton, and uh, so it's not right in the city of Dayton or anything. It's, it's, a, it's a nice suburb. Uh, south of Dayton but even if you look at the they showed the picture of the home from the other guy that did the shooting at the Walmart in El Paso and they showed his house as well in the neighborhood he lives in both of these um, psychos I guess we can call them both of these psychos you know came from pretty nice you know areas and uh, you know kind of upper scale so you know we're, we're, we're talking about something completely different here uh, so I don't know. I mean, who can get in the mind of these people? But I think again, the issue always goes back to guns, and it's it's a, it's a failed argument. It'll it'll be a, a week of you know the same thing we get over and over again every time there's a mass shooting, but they never actually get to the root cause of the issue, which uh, I think there's probably many root causes of it. And I'm not an expert in this field, but I do know that guns do not uh, on their own just get up off the table and start shooting people. It takes a sick person to point them at an innocent person and start pulling the trigger. Um, so I think the issue is with the individual, not with the gun. And uh, I think that um, 
I think that the issue is that we need to take a uh, maybe start asking questions about maybe how we're how we're raising kids, and I think that uh, I am a big supporter of uh, of of boys specifically having a male father, uh, and uh, that's the best case scenario. You, you don't always have that, and there's some females, some mothers who do a very good job raising sons, but I think it's harder. Uh, I think uh, men can do a better job disciplining or you know a son especially if he's got an attitude or that sort of thing so I think a lot of this has to do with the way kids are raised uh, families the breakup of the family um, values have changed we've uh, we have um, cheapened life in general um, and all these sorts of things and of course you, you know I don't even listen to the arguments of the left wing anymore the liberals they act like it's all about human lives and saving human lives. This is uh, just BS. It's just politics, because uh, the the highest number of gun deaths that you'll see occur in places where they where you're not allowed to have uh, guns, uh, like Chicago and places like that. Uh, both of these shootings happened in places where you're not allowed to have guns. Um, one was in a gun-free zone in the area up here in Dayton that was inside of a bar and in the state of Ohio even if you have a carry permit you can't take your gun in even if you're an off-duty cop a buddy of mine is a cop when he's off-duty even though he always has his gun with him if we go in some place where they serve alcohol he has to leave the gun in the car so you know both these places were in a sort of gun-free zones I guess you would say and you know liberals I mean they don't seem to care about the hundreds of thousands or millions of uh, late-term abortions, uh, in fact, even post-term abortions is fine with them. They have no problem with uh, that. So when they tell me it's about human lives, th they lose me right there. I don't even listen. As soon as a liberal says it's about human lives, no, it isn't. If it was about human lives, they would be concerned about the hundreds of thousands or millions of abortions. <laughs> uh, it's not about human lives for these people. It's just politics. It's just politics, and that's uh, what's bothersome about the whole thing. So. Um, Anyway, yeah, it's sad what happened, uh, two shootings over the weekend, but, you know, um, uh, we have, you know, 40, 50,000 people a year killed on the nation's highways, but, uh, I mean, is, do you hear people uh, calling for the banning of cars? Uh, no, you don't. We have thousands of people every year die from uh, 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 murders or assaults caused by hand tools, hammers, wrenches, you know, things like that. Uh, we don't ban hammers and wrenches. so. I mean, it's, 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 it's not the tools, and, and a gun is just a tool, a car is just a tool, lots of tools, lots of things on this planet that can get you killed. Cleaning your roof, slipping in the shower, uh, short, shorting out something in your house with, uh, with electric and electrocuting yourself. These types of things happen, they're accidents, so lots of people die from them. Um, and, and always taking the issue to guns is just really, it's a fruitless argument. It goes nowhere and it accomplishes nothing, but it's what we get every single time around. What really, if people really want to get honest about it and start trying to get to the real bottom of the problem, we need to ask ourselves, what is it that is causing these kids to uh, act up in the way they do? And uh, I think that you'll find, if you investigate this a little bit, is that a lot of these kids are on antidepressants and things like that. So guns have been around forever, but this rash of killings that we see seems to... Uh, uh, match up pretty well with the time when we really started instead of disciplining kids or what my, you know, when I was a kid growing up, our parents would just, you know, when we run around the house like wild Indians, they would just say, you kids get out of here. Go, go out and play. Get out. Go out in the house. Get out of the house. Go. Go out and play. That's what they would say. Now, you know, uh, they take the kid to the doctor and they put him on Ritalin or some other uh, psychotropic drug. Um, when I was a kid, if we acted up, it didn't matter where you were. If I was, we would be in a store, uh, it didn't matter where it was. I mean, you'd get your ass warmed up. I mean, my mom, dad spanked me plenty of times in restaurants and stores, wherever it was. It didn't matter. If I was acting up, I got spanked right now. Now, of course, we're not allowed to spank kids anymore. Uh, so I think there's a lot of reasons. I think it's the way we're raising our kids, I think, is where we need to start uh, focusing and not on uh, the tools uh, that are available to all of us, which can be used for good or for bad. So that's my thoughts on that. And now let's get to the next thing on the list. <clears throat> uh, and let's see. Yes, uh, okay, so we talked yesterday about the fact that Ocasio-Cortez has fired Chakrabarty, her, uh, I guess, her chief staffer, 
um, and it appears that also her spokesperson also has been um, fired. And that has a lot to do, I think, with that meeting that Nancy Pelosi said and uh, that we talked about yesterday. And I think she told Ocasio Cortez, this, you know, this this um, I think this person was influencing her a lot. Uh, this Chakrabarty and this uh, communications person that she had working for, they were the ones sending out tweets attacking other Democrats. And I think that that's where Nancy Pelosi drew the line and had a meeting with Cortez and said, look, from this point forward, no more attacking Democrats. You don't do that. To attack the president, attack Republicans. That That's what you do. We're Democrats. We don't attack each other. You attack the other side, not, not your own team. That's something the Democrats are pretty funny about. So I'm sure that... Uh, that's a, had a lot to do with that, and I would not doubt that Nancy Pelosi probably told um, uh, AOC that because of those nasty things that Chakrabarty uh, was tweeting about Democrats, that they have decided to uh, <laughs> uh, push for him to be investigated for campaign fi finance violations. And uh, so because that bureaucracy is run by Democrats, uh, now, if it was a Republican, no, they wouldn't investigate anything because the Rotten Reverend Clinton had major violations during 2016. Uh, and, of course, this was brought up weeks and weeks ago, and the Democrats weren't interested, and uh, nobody was investigating then. It only is after Nancy Pelosi and Democrats were attacked by Chakrabarty did they decide that they needed to investigate him for campaign uh, finance violations. So I think that that's what happened is Pelosi probably said, hey, you know, this guy has been attacking us, and you got to make a choice. You're either going to stick with him and, and be investigated right along with him, and you're on your way out the door, or you can cut ties with him, clean up your act. Maybe we'll let you stick around, and we won't draw your voting district out, <laughs> or we won't run someone against you. But you gotta, you you got to uh, moderate yourself. You got to get in line, and you cannot attack Democrats anymore. And I think that uh, that's probably what happened there, uh, because as we can see. Uh, uh, AOC fires Chakrabarty and, and, and the number two, the, the communications person, and then the very next day, the news story is now we find out that uh, he's being investigated, and, and that wouldn't have happened without Democrats pushing it. So that's what they're doing to, uh, that's what Pelosi is doing to rein in AOC, uh, forcing her to fire her two top people, her staff guy and her, and her communications person. And then, of course, laying down the law and letting her know you don't attack Democrats anymore. And if you do, uh, we're going to get rid of you, plain and simple. You'll be back tending bar in New York. I think that's pretty much what it looks like to me. Uh, and we'll have to just see how that plays out. Maria Bartiromo uh, was on this uh, on Sunday morning. She was talking to Trey Gowdy, and she told Gowdy that prior to coming on the show, she called Papa Galopoulos just to lock down something that that he was talking about and that Trey Gowdy was talking about last time he was on Maria Bartromo, which is when Gowdy said, yeah, there's, there, there's, a, there's a transcript of, uh, of a conversation between Papagalopoulos and one of these informants uh, where Gowdy said it's a game changer. And so Maria Bartromo, trying to get to the bottom of that, talked to Papagalopoulos and he said, yeah, I think I know what Gowdy's talking about. I think he's talking about that meeting I had with Halper where we went to dinner and Halper tried to uh, tried to bait me with with the Russia stuff, and I didn't bite. He got real mad or whatever, and uh, I basically told him, no, it would be traitorous. In fact, I think I wrote down the uh, phrase. Yeah, well, not the exact phrase, but um, Bart Romo said that Papagalopoulos told her that he rejected Halper's offer for help from the Russians. So Mar Maria Bart Romo tells Trey Gowdy, she says, I know you can't talk about it, it's classified or whatever, but I talked to Papagalopoulos, and he said that what you're talking about is this conversation with Halper, where, where Halper said, hey, you know, the Russians got this stuff, that'd be really good for you guys, or whatever, at which point Papagalopoulos said, hey, that's treason, I would never engage in anything like that, you can be hung for that, don't ever talk about that again, or whatever, and that's when Halper got mad, got it from the table, or whatever, and uh, so I think that it's pretty sure that that's what we're talking about, but I, I think that there, there may be transcripts from Downer, I don't know, that's... People are speculating on that, but Trey Gowdy said that, that that is not the only transcript of that sort of thing, which of course would be exculpatory information, which should have been in the Carter Page FISA, which was not, and um, or even in the Papadopoulos charging statement was not there. So Trey Gowdy suggesting it's not just that one transcript, but that there are others where uh, Trump team campaign members were baited with uh, 
the Russia thing, and none of them bid on it, and it all would have been exculpatory evidence, but none of it was included in the FISA warrants or in the charging statement on Papagalopoulos. So uh, I think, yeah, there's uh, a lot to that, and uh, we'll continue to watch and see. Be interested when this stuff is finally declassified and, and comes out. We'll probably learn about some of this. Some of this we may learn about from the Horowitz report. Because you can bet that Horowitz has probably seen that by now. So we might find out about it then. Uh, we are now learning that it was, just as I suggested, um, uh, the Senate, McConnell specifically, and, Bar and Burr, McConnell and Burr, basically were the ones behind railroading Ratcliffe. Apparently they wouldn't even return his calls uh, when he tried to talk to them. Um, so, yeah, I, it's just as I thought. I, uh, you know, he's not deep state enough for uh, most of the members in the Senate. Certainly no Democrats would support him, and quite a few Republicans would not even support him. I think it was just a simple matter of probably Lindsey Graham or someone in the Senate doing a head count and calling the president and saying, hey, Mr. President, this deal with, uh, you know, you, you may like Ratcliffe, but I'm telling you right now, he'll go through a hell of a nasty <clears throat> process. <clears throat> And ultimately, he will probably not be confirmed because the votes probably are not there. You don't have the Republican votes to get him confirmed. I think that's probably what happened. And uh, this story here about McConnell and Burr <clears throat> giving him the thumbs down is probably the reason why. I think if um, Ratcliffe and Trump believed that they could get the votes from the Republicans that they need, I think Ratcliffe would have um, dealt with, uh, you know, uh, the onslaught, because again, they knew from the very beginning, uh, both knew that he's going to be under assault. Whoever Trump nominates is going to be under assault unless they're total deep state. Um, so any honest man that he nominates is going to be under major assault. They both knew that. So that's why I said there has to be something else going on here. It's not like they just figured out that Ratcliffe would be under assault if he decided to take the job. So uh, yeah, there had to be something else going on there. I thought so. And this is pretty much what we're learning now, is that uh, McConnell and Burr uh, gave him the thumbs down. Well, there's the Senate Majority Leader, and there's the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, right there. Those two, you don't get those two, you don't get, you don't get the nomination. That's just plain and simple. So, yeah, it was the deep state Senate that shot down um, Ratcliffe, and that's uh, the bottom line on that. <clears throat> so it looks like my instincts were right again. Now, the name that's being floated now... Um, there's two names being floated. Pete, uh, Pete Hest, he Hextreth, I think his name is, which I don't know too much about him. He was on the House Intelligence Committee. <clears throat> don't know much about him. I'll have to look into him. But I do know a lot about Fred Flights. And Flights was the first guy who was, name actually did come up even before uh, Ratcliffe's name came up. They were floating Fred Flights. So the flights is interesting, and flights uh, actually opens up a more interesting conversation uh, that I don't think we've ever talked about here on Tower Gate ever. And uh, so I don't. It's, I, I could do a whole whole hour on this. I don't. I have about five minutes, so let me just sort of um, let me just go very quickly here and give you the short take on this. Um, so something very interesting with Trump is um, that I figured out quite a while ago is that um, uh, when Trump became president, he really split the neocons. He split the neocons. Okay, so when we say neocons, what are we talking about? Okay, so the neocons were originally, uh, they were hawks. They were Democrats, liberal Democrats. They were in the Democratic Party. They were liberals. But in 1968, when the Democrats nominated George McGovern, a lot of these um, liberal Democrat, Democrats left the Democratic Party joined the Republican Party, and they sort of gave themselves the name the neoconservatives. So their issue was really a couple things, two, maybe three things. Number one, they are hardcore proponents of Israel. Number two, they are hawks on defense. They like a lot of defense spending. And number three, they really believe in an interventionist foreign policy, fighting wars, specifically in the Middle East, and even more specifically, wars in the Middle East to benefit the interest of Israel. So this is what drives the neoconservatives. They, all the other types of things that people argue about, abortion and all these other things, they're lefties on all those issues. They're for gun control, they're for uh, abortion, they're for all that stuff. 
they only appear to look conservative because they're hardcore supporters of Israel and on uh, big military budgets, and that's for the purpose of the wars that they want to have uh, on the interest of Israel. So in 1968, Democrats nominate McGovern, who at the time was certainly known to be a hawk. He was a self-admitted, I mean, dove. He was a self-admitted dove, was very, very anti, um, uh, anti-war, uh, anti-intervention, and all that sort of stuff. But more importantly, uh, it was pretty well known that he was not necessarily the most uh, enthusiastic, overwhelming supporter of Israel's interests. Not necessarily that he was anti-Israel or opposed to Israel, he just didn't uh, prioritize the uh, interest of Israel uh, in, in, at the proper level that the neoconservatives would like, which is at the very top of the list. There's nothing more important to a neoconservative than the interest of Israel. That's primarily, they're, they're a one-trick pony. That's all they care about. So in 68, when, they not, when, when Govern, McGovern was nominated, they, all these liberals left uh, McGovern and the Democratic Party moved over to the Republican Party and they began building their base inside the Republican Party and by the time we got W. Bush literally W. Bush's entire administration was nothing but these neocons Fred Flights was one of them he was a huge proponent of the Vietnam uh, I mean of the Iraq War of the war in Afghanistan he was fully on board with even more wars in the Middle East and in, the, in uh, support of Israel so this is why I've always been skeptical of Flights and um, he's, you know, I've always seen him as a big government neocon for the most part, fairly liberal, big government neocon. But for whatever reason, once Trump was elected, um, he split the neocons because you still have a lot of neocons that just absolutely despise Trump, like Max Boot and, and uh, you know, Wolfowitz and all these guys. They despise Trump. But other neocons really became Trump supporters and flights is one of them. And it, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that Trump's been very supportive of Israel and he likes big defense budgets. So I think uh, there's, uh, that's the main reasons why some of the neocons support Trump and some don't. Now, I've not heard much about like Dick Cheney, uh, but uh, you don't hear Cheney making too many comments about Trump, although I don't think he comments much anymore. I think he's kind of, you know, up in years. I don't think Cheney's much in the public debate anymore, but his daughter certainly is out there. In fact, she was just on ABC This Week with George Stephanopoulos two weeks ago, giving a vigorous defense of Trump. And not only that, she was really digging in to saying, hey, I think that uh, there was an attempted coup. I think we need to investigate it. I think, you know, that's what was going on here. So so Liz Cheney, and I'm sure a lot of it's political, is, is, is seeming to be a major supporter of Trump, defending him vigorously every time I see her. And... Um, so, um, you know, Trump definitely split the neocons, and that's a very interesting thing to keep in mind. And Flights is one of those neocons uh, who was part of the Bush cabal. But uh, with, uh, since Trump's been president, every time I see Flights, he's defending Trump. And uh, he also is one who thinks that we need to get to the bottom of the Spygate thing and what happened, or he pretends to anyway. So it's very, very tricky there how that works out. But that's my only reservations with Flights is I know that where his core center is, he is a supporter of the president, at least apparently at this point, but he's still too neocon for me. He wouldn't be my first choice, um, but uh, we'll see what happens on that. Uh, Joe Biden, of course, uh, out campaigning, and I guess the sun, the heat, whatever's getting to him, because he's claiming that the economy is collapsing. <laughs> the economy is collapsing. I'm not sure exactly how Biden can arrive at that, what numbers he's looking at. I'm not sure what world he's living in, what planet he's living on, but anyone who's going to try to make the argument that the economy is collapsing is literally out of their mind. The Democrats are not going to win on the economy. I can assure you of that. That's why you don't hear them talking about the economy. Not very much. And of course, uh, we're getting a full, uh, again, a full blast of the mainstream media blaming Trump for the shootings that occurred over the weekend. Again, uh, it's all politics. I've already gone through this uh, on this video, so I'm not going to do it again. But uh, I will say this, that we had plenty of mass shootings uh, during the time that Obama was president. We had plenty of mass shootings when Bush was president. We have mass shootings when Clinton was president. 
and I don't uh, remember the left-wing media uh, blaming uh, Obama, Clinton, or W when all these things were going on, uh, but they blamed Trump uh, just because he's Trump. So this is, I think most people are smart enough to realize that, uh, so uh, I don't put much stock in it. It's exactly what we would expect from these people. From the demon cats. <clears throat> That's what they are. They're demons. These people are literally demons. Okay, let's do Dumbass of the Week. I was a little surprised, actually. I, the person I thought would win uh, hands down this week got a lot of competition. And in fact, uh, now the person I thought would win did win. But the second place finisher did better than I thought. Okay, so let's go through the list here. Uh, we have Patty Willing. Patty Willing. She went with Elijah Cummings. Don Lemon and the guys who were throwing water at the cops. <laughs> yeah, those dumbasses. You know, the funny thing is about the guys throwing water at the cops is there are certain, I guess, areas of the country where you can get away with this. And I'm just waiting for the group of people that try to do that in a place where you can't get away with that, like where I live. <laughs> if, if, if a bunch of kids decide you're going to throw water on the cops in the county where I live, they are definitely not going to like the result. <laughs> they will absolutely get beat down, arrested, and uh, taken to jail and charged with uh, uh, felonious assault or something. So, yeah, it just depends on where you're at, whether or not you can get away with that or not. But, yeah, Patty, uh, very good uh, picks this week by Patty Willing, Elijah Cummings, Don Lemon, and the guys throwing water at cops. Uh, we have Jenny. She went with Elijah Cummings. Well done, Jenny. Lori Holt. She's also on board with Elijah Cummings, Kamala, Legs in the Hair Harris, and, of course, Don Lemon. Three good picks there by Lori. Jay Brown went with Kamala, Legs in the Air Harris, and also uh, mentioned that uh, specifically because she really had no response to Tulsi Gabbard. Very true. I mean, I, you know, I, th I think that's probably, it wasn't so surprising to me that Tulsi Gabbard or, or someone hit Kamala Harris on a record in California. I think it's not like it's a secret. What surprised me most is how Kamala Harris handled that. And as you can see, she's got a glass jaw. Uh, no one's really hit her yet, but she's now demonstrated that she has definitely got a weak spot and a glass jaw. And now the other candidates are going to watch that. And now they know that they can hit Kamala Harris. And when you do, she doesn't really respond very well and especially in the area where she's vulnerable. She she had no com comeback for this, and I'm surprised she didn't because this is not something that's not been talked about before. I think what surprised her is that a Democrat went after her on this. I think she thought she was safe, but as we can see with the Democratic field, nobody is safe. They are turning on each other. They're going after Obama, they're going after Biden, and eventually they will all turn on each other, as is the case anyway. When you're competing in a primary, you have to be prepared to defend yourself against anything that, that you're aware of that may be out there. Kamala Harris should have had a response for this. She should have been expecting it. And you're right. Um, you know, Jay Brown is absolutely right. It was her response to, or lack of response to Tulsi Gabbard, which is probably uh, what made her look like a real dumbass. Okay, uh, Stage Door Johnny went with Donny Deutsch. <laughs> yeah, Donny Deutsch, his name doesn't come up very often in Dumbass of the Week. Uh, but for many of you, I'm sure if you've ever watched CNN, uh, he's a regular contributor. This guy is completely, absolutely, 100% unhinged as you can get. This guy is unhinged as, as it can get. He, he says crazy things all the time. And I'm guessing that what uh, Stage Door Johnny is referring to is maybe the comment he most recently made where they're going to beat Trump and they're not going to play fair to do it or whatever. I think that may be what he's referring to. But it could be anything he said. He says a lot of crazy things. <clears throat> Joe Mack. <clears throat> Joe Mack uh, went with the Obamas. <laughs> Barry and Mike. Barry and Mike and their role or their activity in regards to the coup and the way that they're handling it, I guess you could say, uh, their non-response to it, uh, or whatever, is this is total arrogance that they have, uh, just like the arrogance of uh, Comey and all the rest. And that's why it's so important that Barr and Durham bring these people back down to earth. Well done, Stage Door Johnny. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Joe Mack, I'm sorry, Joe Mack. Thanks, Joe Mack. Uh, Jeanette, Jeanette went with Cummings. 
and Headboard Harris. <laughs> Headboard Harris. I like that one. Yes, indeed. Jeanette. Cummings, Headboard Harris, and Don Lemon. <laughs> as Tucker Carlson calls him. Yeah, Don Lemon is an asshole. Uh, and I think most people saw that clip of him badgering that, uh, that black minister. And it didn't uh, look very good. didn't go over very well. The optics were pretty bad. And Lemon's been taking a beating for it, as he should. Lightwater. Lightwater went with uh, Kamala. Yep, Kamala. Uh, I actually thought that she would be the dumbass of the week this week. Uh, Gene, he's going for liberals who use uh, gun control arguments after shootings. Yes, indeed, Gene, we get this every single time. And as I said earlier, they never address the real issue, which is the mental health issues or other issues uh, surrounding, uh, surrounding what makes a person do something like that. Uh, and, of course, uh, Don Lemon and Brian Karim. Brian Karim, of course, is the uh, Rolling Stones reporter that was acting like an asshole uh, at this uh, at a uh, press event at the White House a couple of weeks ago, who's now been suspended. Uh, Mara, the lovely and talented Mara, uh, she went with Kamala, and uh, she specifically got a problem with Kamala this week because of that interview she did where she was ripping President Trump um, saying that he's abused his authority because he helped get this rapper uh, who's, I guess, uh, Rocky, uh, what's his name, uh, Rocky a ASAP, I think he goes by Rocky ASAP. Trump got, of course, this rapper, Rocky ASAP, released from jail in Sweden uh, and uh, got him home, and Kamala Harris is suggesting that Trump abused his authority by doing so. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how, that, how that's a winner for Kamala, but who knows. Then we have Douglas. That's right, Douglas. And he goes with Marianne Williamson. <laughs> oh, get rid of the bullets. Is that what she said? I didn't catch that, Douglas. But uh, yeah, that would sound like something Marianne Williamson would say, get rid of the bullets. As if she doesn't apparently realize that people like, you know, me, when, well, not so much me now, but when I was growing up, we actually packed our own. We, we bought our own gunpowder, our own casings. We had, a sh we had a loader for shotgun shells and for bullets. We actually packed our own rounds because we did so much shooting. So I guess she doesn't realize that people can buy gunpowder, casings, and loaders and uh, make your own bullets. She apparently doesn't realize that. Uh, Peter James <clears throat> went with, yes, Peter from the Great Northwest. He went with Kamala, Legs in the Air Harris, uh, and, of course, um, the FBI uh, is number two pick for putting out that report, uh, trying to tie uh, the conspiracies, the so-called Spygate conspiracy is now terrorism. If we're talking about Spygate, we're terrorists. That's, that's, that's nice. And then, of course, uh, Gavin Newsom and uh, his tax deal that he's talking about. So, very well done. Peter James, good picks. Uh, Sherman Lynn uh, went with Kamala, legs in the air Harris. And we had Jamie went with William Barr. <laughs> I was waiting for someone to go with William Barr. I thought he would get a couple of votes this week. Uh, yeah, and I guess we could say maybe a dumbass move. I don't know. I think it's maybe too early to tell. I wasn't very happy about it, as most of you know. But I think, in all fairness, we have to just wait and see what happens on this. Uh, I, I don't think that Comey's out of the woods. And I, I think at some point he absolutely has to be charged. Uh, he's involved in too many things. So we'll have to just see. But, yeah, I mean, I can appreciate where someone would want to give Barr that vote this week. Okay, so uh, our winner for this week for Dumbass of the Week looks like it's Kamala Harris. Kamala Legs in the Air Harris, or Headboard Harris, <laughs> whichever you prefer. She's the Dumbass of the Week. <clears throat> and number two, a close second, only losing by two votes, Elijah Cummings. And then coming in third, Don Lemon. There you go, Kamala Harris, Elijah Cummings, and Don Lemon. Thanks so much, everybody, for um, playing the game. Very much appreciate it. Be back tomorrow with more Towergate. You guys have a good night. See ya. Bye.